recording this computer. Okay. Can you see this okay? Can you see the I, I can see it. presentation? Okay. Great. Yes, but it's it's not full screen. Oh really? I've tried no. I thought I full screened it here. Um I'm gonna stop sharing and try and share again. Yeah, I think you have to do it from in the from the Adobe go to view full screen or, or mm. It seems like by doing so, I've just seemed to have lost the Zoom thing and I can't get it back up. So okay. just bear with me a sec a moment. I'll move Zoom onto the other window. View full screen. So, sorry, Mark, I accidentally muted you. How's <laughs> 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 that? Metal How's that? S subconscious, <laughs> yeah. like, yeah. like, subconscious desires. There, he's got. <laughs> uh, when I want, when I want to talk to you, I click the wrong button. I think I'm muting my, I'm muting myself. <laughs> <laughs> Sabotage. Okay, that looks um, good. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah. Great. Great. Okay. So, thank, thanks very much. Thanks for that kind introduction, and thanks for inviting me to speak. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking about these particular kinds of statistical models that are being thrown around in legal circles. I think they're used elsewhere as well, but there's a particularly important debate in law about the use of statistics in the courtroom. And these models are central to this kind of debate. So I'm going to say a little bit about these, these models and um, say what I think is wrong with these models and then why we should be moving on to looking at real cases where statistical evidence rears its head in a courtroom. So that's the structure of the talk. You can flick on uh, two slides, I think. Okay, so legal probabilism is the view that uh, one can set legal standards in terms of probability very natural for anyone who's had anything to do with probability. It's just, an, this is the way I hear uh, legal standards of evidence. Preponderance of evidence, for instance, just means more likely than not. That is probability of 0.5 or greater, or greater than 0.5, say. Uh, beyond reasonable doubt, my ears at least just hear something like probability 0.95 or thereabouts, and so on and so forth. So legal probabilism is this view that you can specify legal evidence in terms of probabilities. But probability and the law have a very checkered history. Um, many legal scholars have been critical of the use of probability in the law. So a very uh, a distinguished legal scholar, Lawrence Tribe, has a paper called Trial by Mathematics. Where, you, know, you can kind of guess what that is about. Uh, critical of the use of mathematics being kind of the, the, the central player in the courtroom. And Susan Hark, a distinguished uh, philosopher of law, has criticised this view and uses the, fr the phrase legal probabilism as a pejorative term. Um, and like whenever your own position gets has a pejorative term attached to it, you tend to try and turn that into a positive thing. So I hold my hand high and say I'm a legal probabilist in this sense. So what I want to do is, in a way, defend this I think very commonsensical view that probabilities are what legal evidence is all about against what I take to be a, a, a growing um, resistance to this view. So there are many concerns about statistical evidence in the courtroom. For example, there is specific concerns. People talk about worries about using likelihood ratios or Bayes' theorem in particular cases where judge has, has, judges have instructed the jury not to think about Bayes' theorem, not try to update and think in these terms. Um, so here I'll, I'll focus what I, what I think of and is often called naked statistical evidence. Roughly, this is statistical evidence without any other specific evidence about the individual in question. Um, the examples will, will make this clearer, but the, the, the basic idea should be you know, clear enough that you're just using statistical evidence, not say eyewitness testimony or, or, or the like. So first, a couple of remarks about methodology. So 
if you're someone who is suspicious of statistical evidence in the courtroom setting, at least, a number of different things you could do. One would be to look for cases where statistical evidence alone was used to convict, and there are such cases, and argue that the conviction runs counter to reasonable intuitions. Clear injustice here. This person was convicted on statistical evidence, clearly unjust. The problem is that real cases are typically very messy and it's hard to isolate the role that the nakedness of the statistical evidence is playing in delivering the intuitions. So if you have a case like that where you think that the injustice, there was an injustice, it's very often hard to point out exactly where the injustice lies. And indeed, um, Scott, Helen Regan and I have written a paper way back in the dark ages about such a case where our intuitions, intuitions ran counter to the statistical evidence. And we went to great length trying to spell out exactly why there was an injustice here despite the statistical evidence. But real cases are messy and you know the real world is messy. So instead, legal theorists and philosophers of law have turned to thought experiments or toy models to isolate the nakedness of the statistics in question. And the idea here, before I criticise this view, I just want to pay it its due, if you like. The idea here is that the real world is messy and you want to point out that there's something wrong with using this naked statistical evidence in the courtroom. So you construct some artificial case where there's nothing else going on except for the nakedness of the statistical evidence. And clearly it would be wrong to convict based on this. That's, that's the idea. So... The thought I think is right. So methodology is right, but there are some problems as we shall see. So toy model methodology, the idea is to present an imagined case where a legal probabilist should be satisfied with conviction or with awarding damages if it's a civil case, because the naked statistical evidence meets the relevant standard by construction. You set the case up in such a way that that's exactly what you get. Um, yet in these cases in question, there'll be a strong intuition that we should not convict or award damages because something's missing. You need something more than just this statistical evidence. What could this something be? Well, it can't be probability, or so the argument goes. Uh, so probabilism, legal probabilism, and naked statistical evidence have at best a limited role to play in the courtroom. And this is the view of those who are critical of, of this view. Now, to the toy cases, which will hopefully make, hopefully make this a little clearer. So the first case, usually called Blue Bus. Mrs. Brown is run down by a bus. 60% of the buses that travel along the street in question are owned by the Blue Bus Company and 40% by the Red Bus Company. The only witness is colorblind. You see the artificiality of this already. Given the lack of further information, one could argue that there is a probability of 0.6 that Mrs. Brown was run down by a blue bus. Yet the overwhelming intuition here is that 60% statistic is not sufficient for Mrs. Brown to prove her case in a civil trial, where in a civil trial, you only need preponderance of evidence, more likely than not. So 0.6 clearly meets that standard. So you can see the construction of this, you set it up in such a way that if you think that preponderance of evidence is to be spelled out purely in probabilistic terms, the answer is greater than 0.5. Here we set it up so that it's 0.6. And yet, um, so the claim goes as an intuition that this would not be enough for Mrs. Brown to prove her case in a civil trial. Okay, so I'm just going to present the cases, then we'll come back to discussion of them. Second example that features prominently in the literature it's called prisoners. 100 prisoners are exercising in the prison yard. 99 of them suddenly join in a planned attack on a prison guard. The 100th prisoner plays no part. There is no evidence available to show who joined in and who did not. Uh, is the 0.99 probability that a randomly chosen prisoner is guilty? Is that enough to prove beyond reasonable doubt that he or she is guilty? The intu intuition here is that it is not. But this does not seem to be explained by the fact that 0.99 is not high enough prob probability to satisfy beyond reasonable doubt, because whatever the hell beyond reasonable doubt means, surely 0.99 is high enough. Um, 
And indeed, the intuition is still there if you increase the number of prisoners and make it a thousand, if you like, if you think 0.99 is not enough, but I think that it is, then you just think you, you change the example slightly. But again, you're supposed to have this intuition here that if that's all you know, as given in this particular scenario, you would not be willing to convict a randomly selected prisoner based on what we've been told, even though there's a probability 0.99 that they're in fact guilty. I won't talk too much about this one. I'll just throw it in for completeness because it's the third example that tends to get talked about in the literature, but I don't think it's significantly different from the last, but let me just present it quickly. So a promoter sells 499 tickets to a rodeo, yet the rodeo is attended by 1,000 people. 501 attendees have not purchased a ticket, so our gate crashes. The promoter sues a randomly random attendee for non-payment of the ticket, since this is a civil case, preponderance of evidence is the approved appropriate standard here. Moreover, since more than half the attendees are gate crashers, the standard of evidence is clearly met. Yet there's a strong intuition here again on the part of some, at least, that uh, were the lawsuit successful, it would be unjust. So when constructing, so on to the next slide now, so a word of caution about thought, thought experiments. When constructing thought experiments, we need to make sure that the situation is coherent and well understood. So everybody understands the, the scenarios being described. Does not invite the reader to bring additional baggage that might get in the way. And I'll say a little bit more about that shortly. And it isolates the hypothesis in question. And you can see what these examples are supposed to be that they're aiming to do precisely those three things. You want a, a situation that's well described, the blue bus, the red bus company, Mrs. Brown is run down by a bus, we don't know what color it is. All of that's easy enough to understand. Uh, you're told to ignore everything else. And I'll get back to that because I think that's one of the problems here. Um, it doesn't invite you to bring further additional baggage to the, to the scenario. And it isolates the hypothesis in question. So in say, take the blue bus case, your reluctance to award damages in that case, despite the probability being 0.6, suggests that probability is not enough. And there's nothing else in the story. So it does look like it isolates the hypothesis in question. And so it looks like a clear counterexample to the claim that probabilities are all we need here. But I'm going to argue that there's good reason to doubt that our early toy models actually satisfies these, these conditions. People don't usually lay it out so clearly as this and say, this is what's required and do they meet this standard? They usually just present the counter example, the, the toy examples and say, see, probability ain't enough. But I think when you lay it out, what, what these examples are supposed to do, it's good reason to think that they fail on a couple of these fronts. We also need to distinguish the epistemic question of probability of guilt versus the liability uh, issue from, from the decision theoretic question of punishment and damages. So, you know, the purely epistemic question is what degree of confidence do you have that the person is guilty in a criminal case versus what should you do about it? So it's perfectly consistent from a decision theoretic point of view to say, I have very high confidence that the person is guilty, but I'm unwilling to prosecute for various reasons. Uh, if you don't think that the, the probability of guilt is high enough, um, you might think that there are other factors involved. So the question of punishment and damages, what you should be doing about it, that's a decision theoretic question. For the most part, we're thinking about the purely epistemic question of, did they do it or not? Okay, so back to the toy models. I won't read through them again, but I'm just going to go through and say what I think is going on. So next, next slide. The blue bus case, we'll talk about that. On to the next slide. So what we're, just to be clear here, what we're being asked to imagine is something very unreasonable. It's not kind of highlighted this, that there is no further information so what you've got is a radically under-described situation. There are two bus companies. There's been an accident. Mrs. Brown is involved. There are, there's only one witness who's completely colorblind, and that's it. 
that's so far from reality. What happens when one is presented with such a under-described situation, again, there's good psychological literature on this, people tend to import information to flesh out the story. So, you know, you've told to, you know, imagine a professor of philosophy. You don't just imagine a generic individual, you kind of have a rough height to them, the color of their hair, what would what a professor of philosophy look like? You start to fill in the details, even though they're not specified. It's very natural to do that. And what you're being asked here is don't do that. Don't bring in any further information. So when reading the example, one naturally fills in the impoverished scenario with a bit of realistic detail. For instance, because you mentioned the word bus, we know that buses run to timetables. They don't run randomly along a given street in a town. And we import that. That's not part of the scenario, right? It's supposed to, in fact, for this example to work, the buses must be running randomly down the street. To get the probability in question, that's what you require. But we know from experience that that's not how buses run. So the fact that someone was hit by a bus, we naturally import stuff that we normally know about buses, that they run according to time tabs. I'm not sure what the buses are like in Liverpool, but here in Sydney, they uh, attempt to run to time tabs and not always successful, but they're certainly not um, you know, involved in you know, stochastic walks throughout <laughs> through Sydney. So and also ask about accident rates of the two companies. For instance, if the blue bus company is accident free and the other one regularly has accidents, that would be relevant information here. Moreover, such information is usually freely available and accessible. Ignoring such freely available information may completely undermine the probability assessment delivering the toy model. So for instance, if you find out that the blue bus company never runs down the street in question, that changes things completely, right? No longer 0.6, probability zero that it was a blue bus if they never run down the street according to their timetables. So in real cases, we can have doubts about the narrative as well. Exactly 60% of the buses, really? Not 61 or 65, 59, right? There's all sorts of uncertainty about the specification of the problem. Again, in, a, in, in the thought experiment or the toy model, you're supposed to just take it all exactly as read. But again, we're not used to doing that. If someone tells us something, we naturally think about the reliability of the narrative. How reliable is this person? Is this story completely correct? Right. So there's all these sources of uncertainty here, many of which are kind of brought to the scenario by the listener. Like, you know, there's no mention of bus type tables in the, in the story. Uh, and by the nature of the story, we're supposed to just think that effectively the buses run randomly. And that's just such an unreasonable thing to imagine. We, without even blinking an eye, we think there must be timetables here. So that's, I think, enough to undermine this blue bus um, example. If you do share the intuition that you're supposed to have, that is that it would, should not be a successful civil action against the blue bus company, even though the probability is 0 0.6, I think there's lots of other reasons to think I want to hold out for more. For instance, to say, well, I, I know that the probability as given is 0 0.6, but I'd like to hear more. It's not that you want something more, something ethical or justice issues or something else coming to the party here. It's just that you know that there are such things as bus timetables and it's free to look these things up. You could get this extra information for free. And if the information that's relevant is freely available, you should avail yourself of it. So that would explain the resistance to, to uh, think that a civil case should be successful here. Next slide. So back to prison yard. Next slide again. So let's discuss prison yard. I won't read through it again. Um, so with prison yard, we have no further information about what went on in the prison yard. Again, that's just part of the story. All we've got is what is told to us, right? 
So no further information, no video surveillance, no testimony, nothing else. Moreover, no uh, past reputations, past, past uh, actions of the prisoners. Some are violent, some are not. Some are there for, you know, um, white collar crime. Others are there for gang violence. None of that. We don't know any of that. So again, really quite unreasonable scenario being asked to imagine here. But there's another problem. It matters whether we prosecute a randomly selected prisoner or all 100. So prosecuting the usual presentation of this thought experiment or toy statistical model is that you randomly select a prisoner and prosecute them. And the question is, the probability of their being involved in the assault is probability is 0.99. So that should be enough to meet the beyond reasonable doubt standard. But it makes a great deal of difference whether you're prosecuting just one randomly selected prisoner or you're prosecuting all 100. Why? Well, prosecuting just one prisoner introduces issues of justice that are independent of issues about naked statistical evidence. So consider a, a parking inspector who finds 10 cars illegally parked and issues a parking ticket to only one of them. And nothing to do with statistical evidence here, right? The parking inspector presumably can see and is absolutely certain that all 10 cars are illegally parked. So there's nothing, no statistics involved in this at all. But issues a ticket to just one, you would rightly complain if you were the ticketed uh, car owner because of injustice. There were, nine, there were nine others that deserved to be ticketed and they just singled you out. So it's unjust. So back to the prison yard, if you were to prosecute just one, that feels wrong without putting a finger on what's wrong about it. The, the uh, critic of statistical evidence says, well, the wrongness is statistical evidence is not enough. I want to say the wrongness here is it could well be because of the un in injustice of prosecuting just one of the 99 involved. So intuition that any single prisoner should not be found guilty and punished in isolation can be accounted for this observation about justice. So the nakedness of the statistical evidence, it's not isolated. Uh, next slide. Um, gate crasher, uh, just next slide again, uh, I'll say just the same thing. I said, oh, I'm not gonna talk much about that. I don't think it introduces any new features that we haven't seen before in the prisoner's example, the same kinds of things going on there. Prosecuting just one of the gate crashes when there's 501 of them is, uh, in, is uh, isn't unfair. And that can account for intu any intuitions you have that it uh, um, shouldn't be justified. Okay, next slide. So what's the place now for toy models? So this is not supposed to be an attack on thought experiments in general or toy models in general. Just as with real exper experiments, um, they or real models, they need to be carefully designed. So it's a kind of supposed to be an experiment that isolates the hypothesis in question, the hypothesis being that probability is enough in these cases. You want to isolate that hypothesis and show that it's not, right? But just in a real experiment, you've got to be very careful that you isolate the hypothesis in question. Um, you know, so if you're trying to show that the boiling point of water is dependent on air pressure, you better not use salty water in one run and not salty water in another, right? Because you're not controlling perfectly for air, uh, pressure in that case. Same thing's going on here. We've got other confounders in our uh, thought experiments, so they're not isolating the hypothesis in question. Um, those who would argue that there's something missing with naked statistical evidence, I think just need to design better thought experiments. And then to be fair, there may be such experiments. But it's interesting that these three are the ones that get all the uh, attention. And I think all three fail for more or less the same sorts of reasons. They just fail to isolate the hypothesis in question. They invite 
the listener to bring in extra material just because you know what a bus is and you know about bus timetables, for instance. So you naturally bring this stuff to the story. And once that stuff is brought to the story, then again, the naked statistical evidence isn't enough, but it's not because of any flaw in the naked statistical evidence. It's a flaw in the design of the thought experiment. So I'm not giving up on such thought experiments or toy models, but given that I'm not interested in defending this position that you know, probability is not enough, I think probability is enough. So those who think that it's not, they just need to go back to the drawing board and come up with some better thought experiments in my book. In the meantime, I think it's better to actually look at real cases. I think there are some cases that are close enough to what you would want. Although as in always, as always, when one's looking at the real world rather than an idealized model, uh, you get you know, a certain degree of messiness that you have to deal with. And I think the closest we can come to here are DNA, cold, so-called cold hit DNA matches. Next slide, please. So DNA evidence provides extremely high probabilities, well beyond reasonable doubt. Um, is there a problem with standalone DNA evidence? Is there something missing? And again, people make this claim. So under ideal conditions, the chance of a false positive is about 10 to the minus 11 and getting smaller as methods improve every day. So a cold hit DNA case is one where you really don't know anything else. So you have a, a DNA sample at a crime scene and you run it through a database and you get a match. And you then proceed with conviction based on that match. And the figure that's often associated here, well, the probability of a false positive is something like 10 to the minus 11. That's clearly beyond reasonable doubt. So there should be nothing wrong with prosecuting based on cold hit DNA evidence. But many people, and myself included here, think that that's a bit too quick and we would like to have something else other than the cold hit DNA evidence in many, many of the cases at least. So any other evidence, for instance, eyewitness testimony, much less reliable than such DNA evidence. This is, this is a whole other talk, uh, which I won't go into, but it's kind of interesting, just psychological fact that people put such weight on eyewitness testimony and yet, a huge psychological literature on how unbelievably unreliable eyewitness testimony is. Uh, and yet somehow or other, if you saw the person and you recognize them again, then that's good enough. And the probabilities associated with eyewitness testimony in some cases are extraordinarily poor. Um, so in any case, DNA evidence is much better than that. But many people will feel more confident if someone said, I saw the person do it and that's the person, picked them out of a lineup, for instance. Somehow that feels more reasonable than a cold hit DNA match. And again, if you have that inclination, so the story goes at least, it can't be about the probability of the DNA match being you know, not, not, not good enough because after all, the probability of a false positive of 10 to the minus 11 is much, much better, order of magnitude better than eyewitness testimony of false positives. But here the proviso under ideal conditions is important. Uh, what we don't get in this estimate of the probability of a false positive is the probability of sample contamination in the lab or at the crime scene, for instance. Such meta uncertainties are outside the scope of the statistical model. So what we have here is a statistical model for the reliability of the DNA evidence and uh, um, all going well, if you like. But what we don't have is what are the probabilities when things don't go uh, according to plan. Next slide, please. So think of this meta uncertainty as uncertainty about the statistical model. It's thus a species of, of model uncertainty. And I take it everybody is familiar with model uncertainty, right? This is a, you've got a mathematical model and you're uncertain about some of the parameters in the model and the 
model uncertainty can be rather large or rather small. If the model uncertainty is rather small, then you look at the reasonable range that your parameters might take and find that you get more or less the same result anyway. So it doesn't much matter. On less lucky cases, the parameters could take a right, but you know, a, a broad range of values. You're not really certain about what those parameters values should be. And the output of the model varies drastically with the, the uncertainty of the parameters. So such uncertainty is not resolved by making the first order probability smaller or larger. Okay, so if we've got a probability, a, a statistical model that's telling us that the probability, for instance, in take go back to the bus case, the probability of the bus being a blue one is 0.6. And then we say, okay, well, I'm uncertain about the eyewitnesses claim that it was a bus rather than a small van. Okay, that doesn't just say, you don't just say, okay, we'll make it 0.55, the probability of a blue bus then. It's back to the drawing board because your statistical model is undermined now. Your statistical model delivered the result of 0.6. And if you're uncertain about the statistical model, you need to do, do something separate from adjusting the first order probabilities that come out of that model. So typically we need another statistical model, for example, to model screw ups in the DNA lab in the DNA case, right? So if you've got a probability of uh, a false positive of one in 10 to the 11, um, 10 to the minus 11 rather, and then you've told that there was a com complete screw up in the DNA lab and no one knows which sample was tested, then you don't say, okay, well, let's make it one in 10 to the minus 10 or 10, 10 to the minus nine or something. You're inclined to say, okay, well, we need to go back to the drawing board here. The problem here is that now we're facing a, a kind of infinite regress because we've got a statistical model. It gives us results sort of the, the DNA testing. We then got uncertainty about the DNA model, the, the statistical model that we're using to derive those probability estimates. And we build another statistical model. We can have the same qualms with that and another statistical model. And you can see how this can lead to trouble. But worse still, this meta-uncertainty sometimes is very large and can completely invalidate the statistical model. Just as a small typo can completely invalidate a computer program. You don't think, okay, my computer program is right, modulo three or four typos, so it should run. No, we all know very well, one or two typos in a computer program can cause the whole thing to fail to run at all. Same thing here. If you find out that the, find out that the crime scene was contaminated, so you no longer have any confidence at all that the DNA sample belong to the accused, all bets are off. Uh, next slide, please. So bottom line is that the probabilities in DNA cases are somewhat misleading. The issue of meta uncertainty is typically ignored. And I, we need to be careful here. It's certainly not ignored amongst those in the know and those who deal with this stuff regularly. It's quite often ignored in courtroom drama, as it were. So given all I've said, and if all of that is correct, what's the fix? How, what might we improve the statistical evidence? Well, for instance, one thing you can do is establish relevant causal pathways. For example, how the DNA, DNA in question got to be where it was. You must have a plausible story about why you believe that DNA to be the, from, to have originated from the accused rather than from one of the detectives investigating the case who didn't wear their gloves on that day or whatever. Um, so establishing a relevant causal pathway, have a story about how the DNA in question can be in fact traced back to the accused. You could provide an account of meta uncertainty, for example, statistics on failures in the lab of contamination or contamination of the crime scenes. And there are such statistics being uh, um, developed on this. So we can actually talk about reliability of one lab versus another lab 
that needs to be incorporated into these estimates. You can't just simply flat, throw out figures like probability of um, um, 10 to the minus 11 and be done with it. You've got to also talk about reliability of the labs, uh, data about contamination of crime scenes and so on and so forth. So perhaps representing meta uncertainty by some form of interval probabilities, sets of probability distributions, or Scott's favorite here, fuzzy numbers, I think we can work uh, some of the work around some of the problems here by representing and faithfully representing the uncertainties in question. Hiding from the uncertainties is just not an option here. Uh, saying I've got a probability of you know, 10 to the minus 11, that's the end of it. No, you've got to actually recognize that there are other uncertainties here and that those uncertainties are not easily accommodated in adjustments of the first order probabilities. You need to do something fancier. Um, another thing one can do is perform a sensitivity analysis on the statistical models. So just as you would do sensitivity analysis on mathematical models in population ecology or whatever in engineering, you can do the sensitivity analysis and sometimes you get lucky and you get the same result no matter what the values of the parameters are within a reasonable range. And it might be that the uncertainty in some of these cases is small enough such that you would be prepared to convict come what may irrespective of the uncertainties in question. Um, you might get lucky like that, um, but there'll be plenty of cases where you won't. Okay, next slide. So more generally, we can look for ways to triangulate. So coming at the problem from different directions is always a good idea. If you've got one line of argument that leads you to a conclusion, it's always more comforting to think that you came to that same line of argument by different routes. So this is sort of courtroom triangulation, if you like. You can't always guard against mistakes in the lab, but you can check that the accused had the opportunity to commit the crime in question. So the law usually requires means, motive, and opportunity. And why I'm thinking of these is not that they're extra requirements taking priority over statistical evidence, rather they're basic checks that it all is in order with the statistical model, right? So if you've got a statistical model that, say, that gives you, say, a, a cold case DNA match with someone that couldn't possibly have been in the country at the time of the crime or wasn't born yet, you know, something like that, then that tells you that there's something wrong with your statistical model. It's not like that's an extra check that you have your statistics and then you have these other things, means, motive and opportunity, and they're not thought of statistically. My way of thinking of means, motive and opportunity is they're just basic checks that your statistical model uh, coheres with other things you know. So there's something missing here. Yes, there is something missing, but it's epistemic in nature. Um, it's more or meta epistemic, if you like. It's uncertainty about your statistical models. And it seems to me in all of these toy cases, that's exactly what's going on. And in the real cases, it's clearer that that's what's going on. In fact, that's why I think it's some, I'm more inclined to look at real cases because you can identify exactly where the meta uncertainty rears its head. Screw ups in the lab, contamination of crime scenes and so on and so forth. So back to the toy cases for a moment, here we're asked to, to do something very unreasonable. Imagine that there's no meta uncertainty and imagine that we can't ask after further evidence. And it's not clear when you read these things quickly that what you're doing is in effect ignoring meta uncertainty. But in the DNA case, if you just run with the 10 to the minus 11 uh, uh, probability, it's very clear that that's all things going according to plan. And when things don't go according to plan, that you have uh, um, some some kind of uncertainty that lives outside the statistical model and that that needs to be accommodated. And I, again, I'm not making suggestions here. Uh, I have no definitive views about how to go about representing that uncertainty. Um, I'm quite fond of um, many of Scott's suggestions along these lines of fuzzy numbers, for instance, or 
other suggestions such as probability distributions, upper lower bound probabilities. There's lots of things one can do here, uh, some more successful than others, no doubt, but anything along those lines would be better than just ignoring it. And I will leave it there. Next slide, thanks. It's just a few references in case anyone's interested to chase that stuff up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, really fascinating talk and really interesting to hear the, li the limitations of the kind of those case studies and presenting statistical evidence in the courtroom. Um, has anyone got any questions? I see, Alex, you've got your hand raised. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much for the talk. It was really interesting. It's like amazing to hear that buses run to timetables as well. That's like that's something that should really <laughs> be, be like more widely adopted. Uh, but yeah, um, I, the whole way through, I was thinking about um, fuzzy numbers, or I don't know if you've heard it called like possibility or like plausibility. It feels like there's a million different names for a lot of very similar concepts. Um, but yeah, does the like impossibility theory? You would have like the support of all the the possible options given the evidence. And you have um, a, like a relative assignment of belief to all of those. And then you would say with that, I want to be 95% confident. So what can I say and be 95% confident about? And like in the bus case, there's not enough evidence to say with 95% confidence that it was a blue bus. So you would have to accept. All I can say is that the bus is blue or red, unless I'm willing to be less correct than that. Uh, like, have you seen notions like that, or are you aware of like the reception of notions like that in legal statistics, or the, the people not really talk about like statistical confidence and things? Um, yeah, good question. I, I mean, as you would imagine, legal theorizing lags behind you know, yeah. cutting edge work on statistics. So even stuff like dempster Schaefer uh, belief functions, which have been around a long time. Uh, that I, I've, I've seen some people mention that in this literature, but you know, the, mostly when they're attacking legal probabilism, they're thinking classical Komogorov probability theory mm. rather than anything else. And uh, in other work, I've argued that that's a kind of mistake because there are lots of shortcomings with classical probability theory. Um, besides worrying about meta uncertainty, just just you know having uh, the option of having interval valued probability functions, for instance, you know something like P uh, the Peter Wally approach. Or, yeah, or, you know, th these kinds of things. These are all uh, have a lot going for them anyway, and they look like they're going to help at least. May not solve all the problems. I don't want to say that you know we will just adopt fuzzy numbers and everything will be fine. Uh, there's going to be devils in the details here, I suspect, but that's a, a certainly not in, a nod in the right direction. But very little of that exists in the, the philosophy of law or legal theory, mainly, as, as I said, mainly because the, the, they're not uh, necessarily experts on statistics. A lot, certainly the philosophers that have been involved in this debate thus far have been largely um, people motivated by justice and legal issues rather than being you know mathematically minded philosophers on the law side there's quite a, a few who are um legal statisticians who get involved but without being too unkind many of those tend to be trained in classical statistics and are not always even sympathetic to bayesian methods let alone kind of dem to shape of belief functions or fuzzy numbers um, so I think it's fair to say there's a lot, there's a lot of cross pollination that would be really fruitful here. I think. Um, I, th I think on on like on the topic of Bayes, uh, I mean, I, I obviously I have absolutely no idea like the the kind of progression of the acceptance of ideas in legal terms. But um, I just said, like it, if judges have had to tell juries like not to consider Bayes rule, like it, it's clearly something that is. Uh, like that has some kind of consideration of a weight behind it. I mean, like personally, 
it feels like a lot of the time Bayes is kind of summoned as this like this is a powerful statistical tool without um like like without always fully considering like what you're implying by like in trying to invoke Bayes rule but do you think there was like in your experience was there a particular I, I mean I don't know has Bayes generally been seen as something useful in aiding these things or was there something that kind of led to base starting to be adopted and could we learn from that to try and prompt the adoption of these uh, newer techniques like can we learn is there something to learn from Bayes there i mean there's two, to distinguish two things here first is a sort of bayesian statistics and the use of bayes rule right everybody uses bayes rule because it's a theorem after all yeah right? classical statisticians use bayes rule the question is under what circumstances can you use it? That's the, I think that's the way I think of the division between classical statistics and Bayesian statistics. Bayesians think they can use it a lot more often than classical statisticians. But the use of the rule itself is sometimes um, singled out in the courtroom as don't use the rule full stop, right? It's a theorem. It's a theorem of yeah. probability theory. So, but to be fair to, the, to those who give that instruction to their juries, charitable reconstruction of what they're thinking at least is if you try and use this you'll most likely fuck it up right so best just use your good judgment here you know what should i believe what's my probability that the defendant is guilty after this new bit of evidence comes in don't try and Price, write down my prior probability, then write the probability of the evidence and do the calculations and, and then come up with a posterior probability because unless you're used to doing such things, you're going to mess that up. And I think that's right. Mm. In fact, even if you're used to doing it, lots of people will still mess it up as yeah. some of the psychology literature shows that people have, you know, fall for the base rate fallacy. Even statisticians fall for the base rate fallacy, right? So we know that people fuck this up. Um, that's not in doubt. So... The question is, will they get a be do better job if they just use their good judgment? And I take it that that's the instruction is on their uh, hypothesis that they will do a better job of it if they um, just use their good judgment here. But, um, you know, a move in a different direction would be to say, okay, we'll make sure you've got statistically literate members of the jury. Make sure we've got people who can actually do this stuff properly. And uh, you know, there, there are problems going that way as well. Mm. But I, I think to be, to be fair to that instruction, I, I think what you should do is when you're presented with new evidence is you should update via Bayes' rule. That, that's, now, whether you actually, there's another question of whether you actually do that in your head or whether you just do it intuitively. And insofar as you get it right intuitively, you can be modeled by a Bayesian agent, right? Yeah. So do I really have a prior probability and a posterior probability for every proposition I've ever considered? No. But insofar as I get that stuff right, then you can model me with a, you know, a idealized Bayesian agent. So again, the question of how you actually do it and what the right answer is can come apart in that way. So I do, I do think you won't need to be careful about uh, pushing people into waters that are too deep for them expecting yeah, them to yeah. use Bayes rule and the like when they're not capable of doing it. And even, as I said, even experts in the area trying to give a sensible prior probability, right? Because a lot of it, you know, for, for a Bayesian like me, it's a lot's going to hang on what your prior probabilities are. And I've got, a, all I've got is a bunch of evidence. I've heard some testimony. How reliable is the testimony? How accurate are the, you know, and I've got all this floating around and I've got to come up with a prior probability, then update on evidence. Incredibly difficult to do. Mm. Um, um, so, you know, stacking the jury with, with experts on probability theory might lead to a whole other kind of set of problems where people are misguided about what the prior probabilities should be, for instance. We started invoking principles of insufficient reason, say things like, you know, well, probability of being guilty is 0.5, probability of being not yeah, guilty yeah. is 0.5. That's my starting point. That's not a good starting point, right, for all sorts of reasons in the law. Might be fine in science, hypothesis testing, but, you know, not, not in the law, you'd think. 
And, and I, just to add to that, I think the point I just skipped through very quickly about this difference between epistemic considerations and decision theoretic considerations, I think comes to bear here as well. So why should the law be different from science? Well, because the stakes are higher by and large. You know, I mean, I know some of you are you know, in, involved in engineering. So yeah, building bridges and nuclear reactors, the stakes are pretty high as well, but a lot of science, the stakes aren't quite so high. Uh, but when the stakes are high, you need to be much more cautious about um, sources of error. And that's perfectly explicable from a decision theoretic point of view. Mm. I'm not sure if that fully answers your question, but yeah, no, yeah, that, some good issue, interesting issues in there, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that like it's not necessarily something that has like one particular. I think yeah, it's definitely worth considering that it is probably a valid point that people will not necessarily be particularly good at applying things like Bayes' rule uh, in the way that you would expect. So just be careful in terms of trying to push things like these forward. It gets worse with some of the other stuff, you know, like Dempster Schaefer or uh, yeah. distribute, you know, you know um, packets of probability distributions and fuzzy numbers. Imagine kind of getting your average jury member to be able to do that on the fly, you know. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Can I ask you a question, Mark? Or it's not really a question; it's a challenge. It's, it seems to me that your argument about the bus example was canard really because i mean we could have made the problem taxis instead of buses and there are no published routes for taxis um i mean your point that uh there's further evidence available and that somehow the not having the further evidence at hand for the for the little toy problem is a is somehow a problem i don't really understand that i mean the, the whole point of the of the toy is to do the that isolation. If you think it's not been done correctly, then just tell us what the right isolated toy problem is. Isn't that fair rejoinder? Uh, yeah, to, to be, the, the sort of short flippant answer is that, that that's not my job. My, that's the job of the person who'd like to put forward the thought experiment. And I agree, taxis would be a better example, but it's funny that they go with buses and, and you know, buses yeah. just come with timetables. And so it's, puzzling why they decided on that as the canonical example so i agree taxis would be better but then there's just going to be different kinds of freely available information you know so for instance um having some information about accident rates of taxi companies for instance you know that would be relevant information do the, mm -hmm. does the density of the taxis do they really run randomly through the town or is this taxi company more focused on the eastern you know east side of town and the others more on the west you know that sort of information may be not so easy to gather but again you have that in your head when someone talks about a taxi you yeah, tend to that, think about that's still a canard because it really you're kind of purposely missing the point and the point is that would you think you know in the idealized case the limit myth where there isn't that information and and, and perhaps it's there is such a case but perhaps there isn't but in that idealized case would it be just to make the to make the finding one way or the other. And, and I think your answer surely is that, no, it wouldn't be just, right? That the statistical evidence alone isn't sufficient. Is, or do you not believe that? No, I don't believe that. I think if there really is no further evidence, then a probability of 0.6 in a civil case is fine. And- um, well, they, they do tend to do try to get away with things like this all the time. I mean, you're, the gate crasher example, for instance, reminds me that I think it was in the 90s that Congress was asked to pass a tax on video cassettes because you could buy video recorders and you could like tape shows and you could take your child's wedding and stuff like that. And Congress, Hollywood was upset by this because they knew that people would be taping shows off TV and they wanted some of that revenue that they wouldn't be getting. And so they wanted Congress to pass a law, a tax on these video cassettes, so the some of which would go to Hollywood. <laughs> you know, as, right. if, as if me simply buying a video cassette on which I could record, you know, playtime at the at, with my kids would uh, would duty bound me to to give money to Hollywood. And there's something deeply unfair about that, even though undoubtedly it's the case that 90% of the video recordings that were done were shows on TV, you know, in clear violation of the copyright rules and 
and they should have been compensated, but they just can't be because it's just unfair. It's intrinsically unfair. Likewise, the prisoner example, it's, it's not that one was picked for prosecution, even if everybody was prosecuted, that, you know, that includes each of the ones too, right? If everybody is collectively prosecuted, we don't approve of that either. Even though 99% of the, of, the, of the people prosecuted are no doubt guilty, we still don't think, and in fact, Netflix last night, I watched this Tokyo trial. And the, the reason some of these guys went free uh, at the, you know, the Nuremberg style trial in Tokyo after the war is because we couldn't specifically identify them as the, the perpetrator. There is something deeply unfair about that. And no matter how many, and you don't believe that either. No, I, I think if you were to, getting put, setting aside the concerns about the unreasonableness and, uh, and under description of the prisoner's case, if the example is changed to prosecuting all 100, I, I have much less reservations about that. I think that, that you're going to have, what, what's, pro, what's problematic about that is that guarantees that you've got a false positive, right? And we know we get false positives in the law, but we don't know which ones they are and we don't know exactly what that rate is. And so we kind of have to live with it. The only way to avoid false any false positives is right, convict no one, right? No one thinks that that's a good idea. So we know we've got false positives in going on in the courtrooms on a daily basis. What's sort of startling about the prisoner case, if you convict all 100, is that you know amongst that 100, there is a false positive and that would be unfair. But any false positive is unfair and we kind of have to live with false positives in order to have a workable legal system. So I, I don't share the intuition that there's anything wrong if you go with all 100. What I think is unfair is picking one out. But the false positive is an, a coded word for reasonable doubt. That, that's what it means. And we want to convict without reasonable doubt. I mean, tribes' uh, arguments, I think, from the 1970s are still completely compelling today. You don't think any of that. I, I, don't, I don't think of it as being be, about reasonable doubt. I think a false positive is a case where you were justified. I mean, all going well, I think of a false positive as a case where you were justified in believing the person was guilty, but in fact, they weren't. So all the evidence, for instance, was pointing to them being guilty. So you prosecuted and, and uh, they were sentenced based on that. But in fact, they were innocent. I think it's grossly ter terrible sort of thing situation to have a false positive, but I d don't think it always means that you violated your responsibilities with regard to beyond reasonable doubt. I mean, you could still think if it was, you know, even in the DNA cases with the probabilities there, you can get these false matches, right? Um, terrible situation, but those false positives are not because you're, violating responsibilities about beyond reasonable doubt. Anyway, I, 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 take, I take your point. I, 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 do you have a view about what the something missing is then? If it's not epistemic, it's not about probabilities, it's not about uncertainty about the scenario itself. You do think there are some ethical issues, for instance, that come to play, issues to do with justice? Oh yeah, sure. Profound ones. I mean, and, and indeed, I mean, I'm not, I mean, Tribe argued that uh, it would be improper to sort of map the P value onto the, you know, the scale that jurists use so the beyond, you know, beyond reasonable doubt and, and preponderance of evidence, that, that scale. Um, and I think that, I think that he's right. I mean, it, it, there are, there are a host of reasons why forensic arguments and, and scientific arguments are different. And it's, and in part, it's having to do with the, you know, this, what's at stake. But we have decision theory. I mean, we could, we know how to balance those things when there are different things at stake. And, and the engineers all the time use decision theory to balance mistakes in different directions. But even decision theory is not right for forensic argumentation or juridical argumentation, it seems to me, because it's, still lacking something quite essential. Um, and, and the cases, you know, the cases like the, you know, the people versus um, the Collins case, that's the, that's the one where the, the black guy and the white girl were driving around in a convertible. And because they matched the description of some horrible crime, they were arrested. Um, 
<laughs> and, and the argument in case was, well, this is the 1960s California. Black guys and white girls rarely w- drive around together at all. Um, and because that's so rare, they must have been the perpetrators. Um, of course, there's something, there's something just disgusting about that argument. But, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> but that's the, I mean, that's the, that was a, a naked statistical argument um, that, that convicted them in the first case. That, that was a bad one, though. I mean, that that's one of the problems, I think, that, that does mislead us all a little bit is yeah. did they actually do the statistics there did they actually have probability of you know they just said oh but in my neck of the woods where i look it's really unusual to see a black guy with a white woman you know so it, it, they didn't really they were making the statistics up in these sorts of cases and that's a not whole other problem i think and which i didn't really talk about but one of the difficulties i think with statistical evidence is it we all know that there are cases where the statistics can be done really badly. Sure. And in, indeed, it, you know, the, it, the it, famous it, Shinobi case that we've worked on, right? Sure. Um, the, the, the statistics were a mess. And because they got the wrong result, that's not the fault of the statistic, of statistics full stop. That's a result. That's a problem with the, the actual statistical analysis that, 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 that they did. Um, there's another famous case in the, in the UK, I think uh, the, the name speech. solicitor with the the uh, two cop deaths in the family, yeah. Sally Clark. Yeah. Do you know the Sally Clark? Everyone know the Sally Clark cup case? So yeah, this yeah. was a yeah. So she was she was convicted and actually served jail time for murdering her two children, which died of cop death. And the statistics were just completely bungled. I mean, it was, but it's often held up as a, an example of why we shouldn't trust statistics, you know, statistics in the courtroom. And again, that's not isolating the role of statistics. That's, you know, bad statistics. So we, no, neither of us are talking about those cases. Um, but you're, you do, I do think, I think you're right, sorry. though, that that seems to be the preponderance of uh, you know, the preponderance of evidence is that people train, bringing statistics in the courtrooms are just bad statisticians. <laughs> that seemingly. Like. Yeah, and, and that's, you know, the more you look, the more you see bad statistics in the courtroom. <laughs> you know, it, it's, that, that's, that's right. But, you know, what, what I'm talking about is statistics done correctly. Is there a role for statistics done correctly? And once it's done correctly, do you really need anything more? And my answer is yes, you do, but it's a representation of the meta uncertainties. That, but that's just more statistics, if you like. Um, so you with regard to se- sentencing, I think then decision theory kicks in and you've got to actually consider values and the like. So I'm with you on that. Oh, really? But not in, uh, not in uh, guilty or innocent, not in the verdict itself. Well, I, this, is a, this is a slightly complicated story. I, 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 my own view for what I was worth is that when the, the, chair, the chair of the jury says guilty or not guilty, they're not doing epistemology. They're actually pronouncing, they make, there's an action. They're, deci- they're saying that the court should act as though this person is guilty or the court should act as if they're not. And insofar as that's what they're doing, making this pronouncement, they're, they're then licensing the judge to go about sentencing or not, as the case may be. And so it should best be thought of as an action. So I think it's perfectly coherent to be on a jury and think this person is guilty, but I pronounce not guilty. Why? Because you don't think the standard of evidence has been met for the appropriate kind of decision that you're involved in. I, and I did, I think when we were look, working on that Shinobi case, I think you, Helen and I all had that intuition, right? We thought that the, the guy in question smuggled more or less the quantity of drugs he was charged with, but yeah. he shouldn't be charged for that because of decision theoretic reasons, not because of pure epistemic reasons. So that's a, that's a controversial view that what the jury is doing is making a pronouncing licensing an action in that way. But if you think about it that way, then there is a little bit more room to move and you think that the value judgments come to play. And if, it also means that the standard of evidence is going to vary a little bit as well. So even something like beyond reasonable doubt, um, 
will depend on the kind of sentencing that's on offer. And of course, again, juries are instructed not to think about sentencing. They're supposed to be just doing the epistemology. But if I were falsely accused of murder in a state in the US where there's a death penalty, I would really, really hope that the jury would interpret beyond reasonable doubt a little bit higher than they would in a, you know, a, a theft case, for instance, right? <laughs> because of, because of the, the consequences. So do you think then that the decision theory is sufficient for verdicts and sentencing on the whole shebang of forensic juridical reasoning? Yeah, I do. I think, I think it should be just thought of decision theoretically. There, there are some good reasons not to go the whole way down that path because for, for, for some sort of reasons I was suggesting with problems of introducing Bayesianism into the courtroom, it's, just, it's likely to lead to trouble and it gets too complicated too quickly. So, you know, what's the utility function that we should be considering here? Whose utility function? There's lots of issues there, but I think in principle, at least you should think of what the what the the court system is supposed to be doing is making a decision about what to do with this person who's before them. Right. I, and, I I hope Mark that if you're ever on the jury, uh, just considering my fate, that you'll recuse yourself now because <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked by you. <laughs> I thought I, well, I'm I'm surprised. I thought we were more or less on the same page here, but that's that's interesting. Right. We, we need to talk more about this. Yes. Sir. Could I, stepping in just to go back to the uh, the prisoner case, and just, it seems like, I, I don't know, to me, the answer doesn't seem that prosecuting all 100 is reasonable because that feels different to getting a false positive because you know, like in, in this imaginary case, you know for a fact that one of these people is innocent and then you'd be knowingly convicting you know for a fact that there is one innocent person that you will be convicting it's not that you you know you might have some doubts as to whether or not they're innocent you know there is one person in there and i don't know that seems like the parallel is to because we talk a lot about like medical statistics and the uh, like the prevalence of something like COVID, for example, might be X amount, but for one individual, it's like you can't make the jump from the population level to then saying specifically for that person, like, are they or are they not? Like you can say, uh, yeah, there's maybe some probabilities, but it's either a, it's either a yes or a no. And then the answer in that case is, as you say, you cannot... I, I, I don't know, in, in, in my mind, it seems like you cannot convict on evidence like that. And you would have to say this case needs more like, let's talk to the prisoners, get indications of what they're doing. But in, in just specifically just the case with the hundred pris prisoners, it feels like there's no moral way to conv like, yeah, I guess there's the moral problem of if you say they're all innocent, then 99 guilty people go free. But it, it's yeah I, I don't know it just seems like is there an issue going from that kind of population level statistic and using that for a conviction of an individual uh i i mean part of the part of the i should just spell out my background here is i, I tend to think it's probabilities all the way down so one of the, the difficulties i find here is when someone says i want some specific evidence what would be specific evidence? Some eyewitness testimony, but eyewitnesses are only reliable probabilistically, right? Um, we and we know that they're in fact notoriously unreliable. Some some uh, close circuit television evidence. What what would be the specific evidence? A again, you've got some close circuit TV evidence. They're all dressed in the same clothes. They're prisoners, for God's sake. <laughs> I mean, who is that? There's always going to be some probabilities associated. So if you're going to resist probabilistic evidence, what else is there, I want to ask? I, I so I'm inclined like, to think yeah. that it's all probabilities. Specific evidence tend to be probabilities about the individual. But there's still going to be reference classes involved. It's just, 
maybe you're coming at it from different directions. You've got different probabilities from different, it looks like the person, the eyewitness said they looked like the person and that combined with the fact that you've got the 99 in the prisoner in the yard, um, maybe that gives you more confidence, but it's not, to me, they're not differences in kind. To mm. me, it's probabilities all the way down. I don't see, I don't think there's any such thing as kind of absolutely certain secure evidence. No, no yeah, I, I totally agree. I, I guess like, I wonder if, for something like an eyewitness account, um, I, I don't know, to say that the, they are like probabilistically accurate, like on, if you gather up like a million eyewitness accounts and then, yeah, you, like you could determine probabilistically, like if we were to get an eyewitness account in overall, how accurate would, should we expect them to be if we're using these as evidence over like a year of cases? But in each individual case, I, I don't know if I don't know if it feels appropriate to then say, yeah, for that individual, then we can say that they're seventy-two percent accurate or something because of that long run frequency. And yeah, I mean, again, whether or not that just calls back to not like binning probability altogether, but bringing in interval probabilities or imprecise probabilities to say, like, well. Yeah, in the long run, it's this, but for this individual, you can't know, but maybe you could suggest it be in this range or something. I, I don't, yeah, again, it just feels like going from the population statistic to that one individual witness, I, I don't know if that feels appropriate. Like, on, on my end, I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 as I said, I just think, given the uncertain world we live in, there's uncertainties about everything. So if, you know, if I want to say, um, typically when we assign a probability, it's probability relative to some reference class, right? So um, if you want to talk about my probability of getting COVID, well, that's going to be, you know, given that I'm residing in Australia, uh, my age group, so on and so forth, going to be a whole bunch of things. But I'm interested in my probability of getting COVID. I'm not interested in people in Australia. I'm interested in my probability. But the only real access we have at that to that probability is via these reference classes. But I can make sense of a single case probability, right? So I do think that there is a probability of me getting COVID full stop. But how I, how I arrive at that probability figure is going to be via reference classes. And there's no way around that as far as I can tell you, you're always going to be looking at population data, um, people in Australia, people in Sydney, people my age group and so on and so forth. And it doesn't seem that I'm violating anything, any kind of um, demand for specific evidence when I do that. And so what is my probability of getting COVID? Well, what are people in what's going on in Sydney? And all of that seems relevant and precisely the way you go about it. Now, so maybe this is something that that goes on in these toy examples is that somehow or other the reference class in question is too broad hmm. and you could have had something a little bit tighter you know, rather than prisoners in the yard. It could have been something like those with past violent records or something like that. But in insofar as you think, like I do, that there's no such thing as absolute certainty and specific evidence that it's all probabilistic. So there's just going to be argy-bargy about what the correct reference class is. And that's a whole other kind of um, uh, quagmire. Are there yeah. any other questions? Sorry. Go ahead, uh, yeah, Alex. Yeah, yeah, it's just, I, like, the, the, in, like, in my head, I, I can see like the, the big problem with the way I'm thinking about it is basically I would just end up reverting to, yeah, for any individual, like you don't know, which isn't really, like that's not a useful proclamation to be able to make. And then saying that you can infer from the population level statistics that for this individual, they're part of that population. So you could infer from that level, that's a reasonable probability to assign to that person. Which, see, yeah, I think that feels like the justification for taking that approach. It, I mean, what, another reason to think back to back to discussion with Scott, another reason to think that there's something decision theoretic going on in the background, at least, not always explicitly, is that if you flip the cases, 
where you're trying to help the person in question. So uh, racial profiling is bad, right? We all agree on that. But racial profiling for medical purposes is seems perfectly fine. And what's the difference? It's racial profiling is racial profiling, right? But racial profiling for possible punishment is a really bad thing. Racial profiling for helping the race in question with for medical conditions, for instance, is a good thing. And so it can't be that there's something wrong with the profiling itself. It's got to be something to do with the purposes to which it's being put, the kinds of things you're doing with it, which is again is suggesting that it's something to do with the utility functions and decision theory rather than the, the bare statistics themselves. Right? Um, and again, in these sorts of cases, it might be that the intuitions are being pushed around here by the fact that you're going to punish the prisoners, whereas she's going to say, we'd like to give a great reward to the person who didn't, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. That, that might might shift your thinking on this. I, I, I'm not sure. It's, uh... But again, I think that's a good kind of test for whether it's the bare statistics that's doing the work. After all, that's the claim. Something's wrong with the bare, bare statistics. That's not enough. And I agree, you know, insofar as we need to represent the uncertainty properly and all of that, once we've done that, then you've got to put it in the proper decision theoretic context and of course, utility functions come to play. So there is something else. But at the purely sort of epistemic level of, do you believe that this person is guilty? Um, yeah, 0.99 in the prisoner's case. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to give the wrong impression. I, I like to talk for many reasons. The, um, the, I especially thought it was very interesting and useful to the, actually this idea of turning it around. Uh, as a way to bring clarity is really important, I think. Um, but also, you you mentioned the the missing uncertainty about statistics. That's obviously you know where we certainly agree. Uh, but not just not just forensic applications, but all you know science and engineering applications need to do that. Um, but also this idea about the means, motive, and opportunity allowing for some basic checks on the statistical coherence. I, that's a really very useful idea. That should help a lot if we. So, sort of learn how to do that in a systematic way. Um, the statistics it would be very helpful. Um, and, and Lev, Lev used to say that he had apparently there's a Russian expression called uh, uh, "he lies like an eyewitness." He you know, tells them <laughs> like an eyewitness because in Russia they recognize that eyewitnesses are just notoriously bad. Did you, did you learn that from Lev? Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> I was like an eyewitness. Did I mean even with that line? Is in that... Russia just just yes. say Lev? Could Sorry, say go on. Do they not? Do I wish eyewitnesses in the Soviet Union not just say what they were told to say? <laughs> apparently, apparently these were criminal cases, so not political ones. I mean, but all, there's also just huge research on how unreliable, with the best intentions in the world, how unreliable eyewitnesses are. Um, just, you know, so, it, I mean, there's a question for you, Scott. If you think that there's something that you require, something else that's required besides the population level statistical evidence, something that's specific, what, what would count as specific for you? Because as I said, I, I'm not sure that I even can make sense of that distinction because for me, it's probabilities all the way down. But you, you're, you suggest well, that in the previous case, there should be something specific to the individuals. What, what kind of thing would, would do it for you? Well, I think it's a larger question. It's not just the, the specific evidence, although that's a piece of the puzzle. But I think that, you know, the way, I, when I was a child, I spake as a child. And when I learned statistics for the first time, I thought, great, a way to organize the world and make decisions about how, how I live my life in it. Uh, and, then, and then sort of things happened and you came to the realization that hypothesis testing in science doesn't answer every single question and you sort of accidentally almost discover, everybody sort of discovers decision analysis because they realize that there are different things at stake and the errors in one direction can be more troublesome than errors in the other direction. And so they, and, and then when you discover a decision, Analysis, you think, great, now I have a way to organize the world and make decisions within my 
you know, as I find myself in the world. And then you realize, well, actually, decisions can be gained. And, and in fact, that they're gained all the time. And, uh, you know, and, and suddenly you accidentally discover game theory. Right. <laughs> so, and then and then and we used game theory to fix the post-war Japan and post-war Germany. And we tried to use game theory when we tackled the terrorism question and found that it didn't work at all. And so we're sort of at that stage yet, yet, or yet again, where we're sort of realizing that we have to have a new methodology for, for planning our world. It's not, it's not decision, it's not hypothesis testing, it's not decision theory, it's not game theory, because it's something else. We, it's clear that it has to be something else. There's not a name for it yet. I call it agent theory, but it's clear that it's something else. And I think that the same is the case in forensics and juridical reasoning, that it's clear that these methods that we've developed in science and management, uh, you know, that go by these names, hypothesis, statistics, and decisions, and, and even game theory, are not sufficient. They're missing some important bits. Um, and, and those bits have to do in part with specific evidence, but also some other issues too. Um, the idea that, um, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt means something other than pure probability, you know, a, a magnitude of some value in the probability domain. It, you know, it, it recognizes the fact that, you know, scientists, you know, well, court, in court cases, they hate circumstantial evidence, right? Scientists love circumstantial evidence. That's the best kind of evidence is what, a, a lawyer would call circumstantial. For us, that's the best kind of evidence. Um, so there's something that's just going on differently. We need to talk to them, I think, to figure out how they think. You know, it takes a long time to figure out how somebody thinks. Um, it, it's, it, there are some weird, there are some weird anomalies, and one of the problems here is sorting out what's data and what's um, noise in the system in the legal cases. So when I give a talk like this to a law department you get responses like, oh, but in such and such versus such and such, it was shown that this was, you know, and what I want to say is, well, they got it wrong there, didn't they? You know, <laughs> uh, Whereas they would take that as data, you know, and there is a genuine question though about what counts as data. When are they getting it right and when are they getting it wrong? And when are your intuitions being led astray as well? That's the other kind of take home, at least I'd like to press up from this talk is sometimes your intuitions can be manipulated by the apparent clarity of the thought experiment, and yet it's not. It's sort of pushing you in various directions. And so even yeah. our intuitions, which we take as unassailable data, you know, clear data, are not such clear. There's interpretation of that. But certainly with the legal cases, when you know, there was a case that went this way or a case that went that way, or so and so threw such and such evidence out of case, out of court, like circumstantial evidence, Again, coming from science, I think, what the hell's wrong with circumstantial evidence? It's just a historical accident that the law doesn't like it. Or character, character evidence, for instance, um, often inadmissible. And yet someone's past history is surely specific evidence. It's a good indication of the kind of person they are. If they've been involved in violent crimes all their life and I they're just, charged with a violent crime here, I surely that's relevant. <laughs> I found Jesus in the main, in, in the interim. That's the issue. I think. <laughs> I think Nick's had his hand up for a bit. Yeah, I was or just going to, it's sort of slightly different, but same theme, um, I guess, is what's your opinion on sort of algorithmic decisions? So if you had a, an image recognition system that said this person mm -hmm. and the suspect um, match with 90% accuracy or some statement like that, what would your opinion be of the probabilities there? Mark, watch out, it's a trap. <laughs> right. Um, I think one should approach this automated algorithmic stuff very carefully because as we all know, there's a lot going on in the algorithms themselves. You can judge by the reliability of these algorithms, but there's all sorts of interesting injustices built into the algorithms that we need to be very careful about. So I, I'm, my own inclination is that I'm not, not um, about to make pronouncements on algorithms in general. I'd like to look 
at the details of exactly what's going on in the in the case because there are various kind of racial profiling and so on and so forth going on in some of these algorithms but setting those sorts of concerns aside if we've got an algorithm that can be demonstrated to be getting it right you know 90 99% of the time across a broad range we don't want it to be very for instance at recognizing uh, Caucasian faces versus Asian faces. We know these sorts of problems arise, but it's actually tested across the board and it's reliable across the board. Or at least we have uh, reliability, false positives and false negative rates for all different um, racial types, for instance. Um, that, that can be done. But if you've got all that evidence and you've got a pronouncement that this is a 99% chance that this is the person recognised, that's a hell of a lot better than an eyewitness, isn't it? I'm inclined to think that you know, once you've ironed out the algorithmic fairness issues, and that's a big, big, big if, right? Lots of problems in there. But if you've set, you're convinced that there is no algorithmic uh, injustices going on, then I don't see anything problematic about trusting an algorithm versus an eyewitness testimony, or at least you, you've, you either trust them both or you trust neither. I, I'm happy to go either way on that because I have very little confidence in eyewitness testimony. Okay. I'm not going to argue back like Scott seems to think I'm going to. You're not going to, tell him, you're not going to tell him about the broken penis. Well. Tell me, tell me, I'd be interested. <laughs> so there was a guy, it was a guy in America um, who had this had the well problem is, is where well, problem is a very little word um where his face matched with um somebody who robbed the bank at gunpoint so the police arrested him and sort of violently arrested him and broke his penis whilst arresting him um but he and he didn't do it but every time some somebody opens the cold case the algorithm flags up, oh, it must be this guy. Um, and so he persistently has been rearrested for the for the, the crime, despite the fact that he didn't didn't do it. Computer says yes yeah, in this case. Yeah, so let me be clear, I'm a, I'm against breaking penises <laughs> in general. <laughs> I'm not condoning that. <laughs> In case there was any doubt, I'm not uh, <laughs> um, But the, the so back to my point about the reliability of an eyewitness. If it was such a close match, would an eyewitness have done any better? If this person really did look like a a, a, a double um, doppelganger of the, the criminal, then surely you would get the same kind of problems with an eyewitness so what what so the question for, for me then is not that what's wrong with the what's unjust about the algorithmic approach well, the, persistence, but, the persistence might be part of the injustice mm. i mean he's re-arrested multiple times uh, and despite the fact that, that you know his file is replete with you know warnings he you know the algorithms sort of have a mind of their own i guess in the the way that I'm thinking will be applied by the police departments uh, is such that uh, an, an, an eyewitness could at least recant and it would stop accusing at some point. Right, right. I mean, and also is the, the, the scope of the searches that you can do with these is also interesting. Yeah. So the, the big DNA databases, right, this, cop, this crops up as well. Uh, right. Rather than in the old days, what you'd do is you'd search amongst the usual suspects and now you can just search everyone in the country or, you know, for Interpol further. And so presumably that's why this guy keeps getting, uh, keeps coming up because they've got these big databases and they can just search. Whereas again, an eyewitness testimony would be limiting their search to, you know, the, local, the usual suspects or people in a lineup or something like that. So there's that, that, that's a kind of separate issue, I think, about just the, the scope of, the kinds of searches you can do when you have these big big databases. And, and I good reason to be worried about that for separate reasons, I think. 
Um, but I presume that's why he keeps getting rearrested is because of being able to be searched for whatever thing that his doppelganger does. Yeah, probably. I mean, I agree with you on the eyewitnesses. There was, um, at least a while ago, I don't know if it would still be there in exhibit at the Science Museum in London that was almost a virtual reality. You get robbed at gunpoint and then 30 seconds later, can you pick out the face of the person that did it? <laughs> or even that mm. what colour clothes were they wearing? Mm. Yeah. And it's like, no, you can't even. And then imagine doing that three weeks later. Is, um, in what and what, you, what often happens, I think, what often happens is the so-called eyewitnesses then, then, then rely on circumstantial evidence. Like, well, the police wouldn't have put this person in front of me unless they really thought that they did it you know, or something like that, which is not what they're supposed to be doing. Um, I mean, it's my worst nightmare that I would witness some serious crime and I'd be called upon to pick people out of a lineup. I mean, I'm, my, my facial recognition uh, module is kind of broken and there's always a terrible trouble recognizing faces anyway. And so to be in that situation, um, it ha actually in fact happened to me once. I was, I was held up at gunpoint in New York City years ago and um, the police arrived incredibly quickly and through me and the other couple of people who are involved in the back of a squad car and went cruising through a local park where they suspected that the the culprits who are kids would be hanging out and I was going to be asked to identify you know these kids and I had no idea I could you know <laughs> it all happened so quickly it was absolutely terrifying but recognizing their faces no chance <laughs> I, I, I think I think it going back to what you said, like I I have thoughts on this, but I think a lot of it depends on, yeah, specifically how does the algorithm work? How does it come about with these proclamations of like, yeah, there's 99% match or whatever. But it again, like I'm always on like team uh whether it's something like a Dempster Schaefer structure, but it might be that, yeah, it might be a 99% match, but it feels like if you're searching these like huge international databases and you're presenting the one that is like a 99% match, presumably there are others within that database that are also very, very close to that. And there should be some sort of indication of like, well, this person is a match for this, but the specificity of being able to say that it's the, like, there could also be all these other people. And like eyewitness accounts would be absolutely terrible in doing that because like, as, as, we've discussed like then they're not great i just feel like if algorithms could give some kind of indication of like the ranges of people that this this guy who had his penis smashed if you could give an indication of like yeah he matches the the suspect but he's also a match for all these other people therefore to arrest him on suspicion that he's the suspect might not be justified because you need more than just that. Given that he could be all of these people, you should ask for more than just that much to warrant an arrest. Yeah, so on my, my, my account, I'd say something like, you would want to check to see that the person uh, could have been in the neighbourhood of the crime in the first place. Um, they have some reason to have committed the crime in question. Um, you know, so means, motive, opportunity. Yeah. But again, not as extra things that you've got to check on, like you get your probabilities straight and then you check means, motive and opportunity, but rather thinking of means, motive and opportunity as a check that you've got the statistical stuff in place in the first place, that you've got the right statistical model. And if you find that you've got a match for someone who is provably out of the country at the time, then you know there's something wrong with your statistical model. You know, um, So I, I do... I, 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 I'm... Mm with those who think that there is something more, I do think that something more is though just more checking on the statistics. It's more about meta uncertainty rather than, than being something that's different in kind from statistics. Um, so even though means, motive and opportunity sounds like it's something different in kind, I tend to think of those as just basic checks on your statistical model. 
Like, yeah, like a means of validating the statistical model you're using. Yeah, exactly. I, I assume that everyone agrees that the new career for that uh, rearrest guy should be bank robbery. <laughs> <laughs> and, and though you're joking, Scott, there there is a kind of line of um, argument that runs runs like that, which is what you want to be doing. It depends on what you want to be doing actually in the court, whether you want to be punishing people for their sort of poor performances, the things they've done or whether you want to be signaling to others, right? The two quite different activities. And if you have got a kind of guilty face, then you know you're going to you know, end up uh, on the wrong end of the law. So what's the motive? Where's the motivation for you to stop? So take the prisoner's case. This is one line of argument that people present. Um, why did that one guy stand out? He might as well have got a couple of good kicks in at the guard as well, right? Because... He's going to be he's going to be charged anyway. So, what's the motivation for not involving himself in a crime? Rodeo. Why did the, why did those people who buy tickets? Why did they buy tickets when they going to they could be prosecuted as well? So, if you're thinking about what you're doing in the courtroom is motivating good behaviour in the future, um, there, there there is a concern that statistical evidence. If you find yourself in a bad reference class, then you might as well you know hang out, <laughs> go all the way with them. Um, be the bank robber if you're going to be charged with bank robbery every time, you know, and you think that that's a, that's the wrong result. That, that surely the legal system should be um, sending signals and prompting good behaviour, um, not encouraging people to criminal careers. All right. Do we have any more follow-up questions? I, I was curious myself whether you've uh, encountered or, or heard about any cases where people have used kind of interval probabilities, for example. Or um, has that not been done to date? I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not, yeah, I, I can't think of any cases off the top of my head, but I'm, I'm not a legal scholar. I don't sort of carry around the, the you know, the all the precedents um, in my head. Um, Scott, do you know of any cases where people have taken seriously meta uncertainty of any kind? Um, Tim Berry used to say that probabilistic risk analysis has never been used to make a decision at any level. Um, so <laughs> even classical sort of Monte Carlo has never been used. In, the typical way you do it is it's really just an intimidation technique. You you get your guys to do the risk analysis. The other team gets their team to do their risk analysis. And then you just weigh the documents. The heaviest one is the winning argument because all the decisions are made as horse trades anyway. And yeah. who knows what goes and, on. And the credentials of the authors of the report as well. Yeah. My guys came from Harvard. Your guys only came from you know, Cal State or whatever. <laughs> Right. Yeah, I can believe that. <laughs> to be cynical, to be sure, but but I, I do think there's a bit of that. So any last questions before we wrap up? No? Well, in which case, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mark Colivan, um, again, for your talk. Really great discussion. And uh, hopefully we will we'll stay in touch and maybe have you again here in Liverpool at some point in the future. I, I would love no. to. I, I was, in fact, this all started by me talking to Scott and suggesting that, you know, once all this blows over, if it ever blows over, I, I, Liverpool is top of my list of places to come and hang out for a while. So I hopefully, hopefully we can do it in person sometime soon. But thanks again for your yeah. comments and, and questions and uh, uh, objections. That, that's really quite helpful. This is an ongoing project of mine. So uh, it gave me a lot to think about. Thanks very much. No, thank you. That was a real pleasure. And um, hopefully we can host you in person soon. All right. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending our talk. And uh, we'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. See you later. Bye-bye.